build those relationships, we actually need to say something about Jesus. We actually need to share something about this Savior that we are trying to connect them with. And this is really clear from the Bible. Listen to uh, what Paul tells the church in Rome about believing in Jesus in Romans chapter 10, verse 14. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? So something needs to be said. And, and Paul was writing to a church that was really diverse. It was a church made up of uh, Jewish people who knew the God of the Bible, but they hadn't yet come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior, as the Son of God. But there was also in that same church a group of people that didn't know this God of the Bible, leave alone Jesus. And in that context, they say, guys, if you're thinking of people that look like you in this church, all of them, somebody needs to say something about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Someone actually needs to tell the gospel. A uh, colleague of mine here at Hope Pack, a Bible teacher, uh, John Caprari, he's been uh, recently talking about the statement that was made by Francis of Assisi. And Francis of Assisi said something along the lines of preach the gospel and if you must use words. Now that's a great statement because it's saying our lifestyle must be in line with the word of the gospel, must be in line with this gospel that has changed us. If there's no consistency between the way we live and what we believe, there's a problem. But what Francis of Assisi said is not actually fully biblical because we are supposed to use words. We are supposed to say something about this message of the gospel that we have received. And that's what we'll be looking at today. We'll be looking at sharing our testimony. How do we go about sharing our testimony? Now before we, we get to that point of looking at how we do that, we must acknowledge that we have fears, we have things that hold us back when it comes to sharing the Word of God. In his book, uh, William Fay, he's got a book called Share Jesus Without Fear. In that book, there are some fears that are identified as barriers that keep us from sharing the gospel with people that are not followers of Jesus. Fear of rejection. Yet they are rejecting God more than they are rejecting you and I. We are the messenger. God is the real message giver. Fear of what people will think. That's a big one. It's not only an issue with teenagers, it's an issue with all of us. Yet, are we supposed to be pleasing God or are we supposed to be pleasing man? Fear of not knowing enough. I don't have enough knowledge about what to say. For many of us, we probably already know enough to share with the average non-Christian about the gospel. We probably know enough to get going. So let's pray and let's ask God to help us with these fears. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to fill us with boldness and to help us say the right things. So as I've said, today we're looking at sharing our testimony and we'll be doing this by looking at the encounter between Jesus and the Samaritan woman as recorded in John chapter 4. And we'll see that the result of that encounter between Jesus and this woman was that other people got to hear about Jesus. 
So Jesus arrives in a town in Samaria coming from Judea and he's tired and he's sitting at this place called uh, Jacob's Well. It's around noon, so it's really hot. And as he's sitting there, uh, this woman comes along and Jesus asks this woman for a drink. Now this woman's response is, Jesus, I am a Samaritan and you are a Jew. We actually are not supposed to mix. She's taken aback by his request because culturally these groups did not mix. But from last week, we know that Jesus Christ was not held back by what society or culture dictated. He was willing to go for none Christians, for those who hadn't yet put his faith, their faith in him, even if it ruffled feathers culturally, spiritually, religiously, he was willing to do that. And they engage in this very interesting conversation. And, and at one point, Jesus says to this woman, go and call your husband. And the woman says, actually, I, I, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, you're right. You actually had, had, have had five husbands, and the man you're with now, he's, he's not really your husband. And this woman is like, whoa, what is going on here? What, what kind of person am I in the midst of? And she begins to change the subject, and she begins to talk about worship. I wonder if she's beginning to get a sense of God's presence in Jesus. And Jesus begins to talk about true worship, worship that will happen in spirit and in truth. And she says, I know that the Messiah is going to come and teach us all things. And Jesus says, he that you have just mentioned, I am he, I am the Messiah. This conversation continues. But it's interrupted by the disciples of Jesus. They come and see what's going on. They're surprised. Wow, Jesus is talking to a woman. And we pick up the story in verses 28 to 30. Power has just gone. Man, we prayed about this this morning. We said, Lord, may the power not go. <laughs> but he knows why he's let it go. So I'm going to speak out loud while we get the generator going. So here we go. John 4. Uh, verse 28 to 30. It says, Then leaving her jar, her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. And then further down in verses 39 to 42, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said, now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. And the power is back. Amen. So the woman goes back to her community. She goes back to the people who knew her. And she tells them, about Jesus. It says she told them her testimony. The word testimony carries the same meaning as the word witness. It means to give evidence. It means to provide an account, a record. So to share her testimony means that she gave evidence or she provided a record of her encounter, her experience with Jesus. And let's see what we can learn from how she shared her testimony and how we can apply it to our own lives. Five things that we are going to look at. Firstly, 
her testimony took priority over other things. In verse 28, then leaving her water jar. She had come to get water. That was the reason she had come to this place. And, and some uh, biblical scholars say she actually came at the hottest time of the day because she knew no one else would be at the well because the, 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 the main practice was to go to the well when it's cool, either early in the morning or late in the evening. But because of her checkered past, because of the character that she was, she was trying to avoid everyone, so she comes at noon. But listen to what happens after she encounters Jesus. This is a dry area. Water is not everywhere. She had probably walked some distance. The man that she was with might have been waiting for some water when she gets back. Who knows what was waiting for her when she gets home. But she leaves her water jar. Why? To go and tell people about this precious encounter, this incredible experience that she had just had with Jesus Christ. We live in a city where water is precious. Some of us live in areas where the water only comes a couple of times a week. Some of us live in areas where we have to buy water regularly. Water is precious. And to think that she had come for that, but as she speaks to Jesus, and Jesus speaks about living water, the water that, that, that quenches thirst eternally, she is blown away. She's like, no, I, I'm going to leave this water jar, and I need to go back and share what I have just experienced in Jesus Christ. She didn't want to be weighed down by this water jar. She wanted to move quickly and share her testimony. Her testimony was burning on the inside of her. And dear friends, it should be the same for us. When we share our testimony, what Jesus has done in our lives, there should be a passion. There should be a sense of, Wow, what Jesus has done is so important. It burns on the inside of me. And others have to hear about it. Some of us work in the media industry. And, and one of the things that makes the media industry so effective is when you have someone in media who is so convinced that the message that they have to bring is so important that it must be shared at all cost. We were in the, uh, during the time of the elections in Zimbabwe, we were in Harare, and as the violence was unfolding on the screen, there were, there were some journalists there that were right in the thick of it, and they were continuing to report the news of what was going on as that violence was unfolding, even at the risk of their lives. It's like, wow, that passion, that conviction, that this message must go out. And it should be the same for us, dear friends. What Jesus has done in our lives, oh my goodness, shouldn't we burn with that? Shouldn't that be a message that is waiting to just come out and we share with anyone and everyone that God would give us the opportunity with to do so? Secondly, her testimony was shared with people from her own community. The woman, we read in verse 28, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, so she was going back to those who knew her. She was going to reach out to people that she was in relationship with. And they listened. They knew this woman's background. They knew how she had been living. They knew how she was living the day she went to get that water. I mean, they would have been saying, hey, what has happened to this lady? We want to know what's going on here. There is something powerful about sharing our story with people who know us. 
people that we have a relationship with because we can't really fake it. They know you. And where there is authenticity, that's an opportunity for the power of God to work in people's lives. They will see the real thing. And if you are in Jesus Christ, if you are a follower of Jesus, what he has done in you is real. It's absolutely real. I know that this is certainly the case in my life. People who, who know me from before I knew Jesus, before I started to follow Jesus, they would say, man, Sheshi, he is certainly far from perfect. <laughs> far from perfect. But something has happened to this man. There's a difference from the Sheshi we knew and the Sheshi we see now. What has happened? It's God. It's the power of Jesus. So your community, the people in your sphere of influence are waiting to hear what God has done in your life. Even if the past might not be all that it could be, God will use it for a purpose. Thirdly, her testimony was about her experience with Jesus. Verse 29, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Jesus was able to connect with this woman's past in a way that so touched her. Come and see this man who told me everything I ever did. And this revealed that there was something special about Jesus. But not only did Jesus know her past, he did not condemn her for it. Because in that culture, that is what she was living under. A weight of hiding and shame and withdrawal and wondering who knew and what voices might have been saying. But Jesus, who knew everything about her, he mentions that as a matter of fact and continues to speak with her. No condemnation. I think that's the verse that Jason read, Romans 8. And there's no condemnation. It's amazing. What a relief. Oh, thank you, Lord. Rather, he tells her that, that, that God, is, God is looking for, for sincere worship. What God wants from, from us is he wants sincere worship. And he says, actually, I, and I'm the Messiah. You're wondering? What's going on here? This is too good to be true. It's, it's confusing. It's, wow, it's, I am the Messiah. He reveals himself to her. And our need is the same as this woman. Whether we know it or not, we all need a touch from God. We all need someone who can look at our lives and say, I know everything about you, but I do not condemn you. My friend, how did you experience Jesus? What was your experience with Jesus? Was it something like this woman? And you might think, well, what if my, my experience was not quite as dramatic as this woman? It's just as incredible. Because a real follower of Jesus knows that whether they have been really good morally, trying to do all the right things, or they have been absolutely shocking, both those groups of people know whatever they did is not enough to be in the presence of God and to receive His glory. They know they fall short, each one of them. So a true Christian will say, yes, my story is kind of like hers, and it's really dramatic. My story is not quite as dramatic, but it's really dramatic anyway. Because God rescues. God has to rescue any kind of person, no matter what we are. 
How did Jesus reveal himself to you? What were the circumstances? You see, that is your testimony. That is your story in God's bigger story. And you can share that with confidence as the Holy Spirit helps you. Touch someone's life. You know, I can identify with this woman. I have a past that's not clean. I was in relationships that I was not supposed to be in. And when Jesus found me, he, he forgave me of all the terrible things I had ever done. Praise God. He did. And then Jesus takes me and then he begins to, to, to really turn my life around. I mean, firstly, he makes me a new creation. There's this miracle of, of, of becoming a new creation. But even as a new creation, there's certain things you need to begin to change and work through from the past. And God begins to change me. He begins to do something. And then God begins to put in me a, a sense that actually the things I thought I could get out of those relationships, out of those situations, actually are satisfied most fully in Him and in my wife, Trudy, who's not here this morning. And then, not only that, God then takes me and then he puts a desire in me to go and tell others about Jesus and what Jesus has done in my life and what Jesus can do in the lives of others. I've just shared my testimony. And you can share your testimony in, in one minute, two minutes, 20 minutes, depending on the situation. And because we do this, in the context, as we said yes last week, context of relationship, it comes naturally as part of conversation. You're doing this with friends. You're doing this with people that you have built trust with. I mean, you can even steer the conversation in a different direction because you are friends. You can make a direct statement and say, hey, listen, can we just change the topic? I mean, don't friends do that? We've spoken about this for a can, can we change the topic? Would it be okay if I say something to you about my faith journey? And a true friend will listen. In relationship, your story, your testimony could be used so powerfully by God to impact someone else. And always be praying. Remember, first part of the series, we said we have to depend on God. We need God, so we're always praying. We're saying, God, give me the strength. God, give me the words to speak. God, open the doors to the hearts and minds of those that I will speak with. God, make a way, and he will make a way. Fourthly, her testimony was a call to come. We sang a song this morning about coming, come to the altar. We're being called by Jesus. And, and in verse 29, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Her testimony included an invitation to see Jesus. She was hoping he would still be around. She wanted them to experience Jesus for themselves. See, when we share our testimony with people in our lives, we're, we're not sharing our testimony for the sake of it ending with us. We're sharing our testimony so that people can be pointed to Jesus. It's about Jesus ultimately. So she's saying, hey, listen, come and see. Come and see for yourself what Jesus has, has done. See Jesus for yourself. We want to point people to Christ. And it's interesting that she's still wrestling with what she has just gone through because she says, is this the Messiah? Could this be the Messiah? Could this be the anointed one of God? I mean, uh, could the anointed one of God choose to speak to a Samaritan? Choose to speak to a woman? Choose to speak to one as broken as I am? Choose to single me out on a day like this and give such focus and attention. So things are going on in her. But she's still willing to go and share what she has experienced and say, come, come and experience it for yourself.
for us who are in Christ, we are not wrestling with the same question. If you're in Christ, Jesus is the Messiah. He is the anointed one of God. But even if you are in Christ, you might be wrestling with some other aspect of your faith. It might be, why, why is there so much suffering in the world? It might be, why haven't my prayers been answered? You see, even in Christ, there are questions and struggles. I've been going through a struggle for the last few weeks where it's just been a season of some really hard things in terms of leading the church. And I'm like, Lord, am I, am I equipped to do this? Is it worth doing this? It can be so difficult. Am I making the right decisions here and there? And God is still God. Jesus is still the Messiah. Jesus is still the one who died on the cross to save me and to save you. And even as we are wrestling with things in our lives, we can still say, come. Come see Jesus. That's faith, isn't it? It's trusting even when things are hard. The final point for this morning is that this woman's testimony led to many believing in Jesus. Through the testimony itself, we read in verse 39, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. The result of her testimony was that many people in her town believed in Jesus. I will take just a few people, for now, I'll take just a few people in my world believing in Jesus because of my testimony. I've recently started praying for a, a particular couple that are neighbors of ours and saying, God, can you use Trudy and I to, to be able to reach out to that family? to be able to reach out to that couple. I'll take just a few to start with. But for this woman, man, it was many coming to know Jesus. The testimony coming from this shady woman, this woman with this shady past, led to many coming to know Christ. And that, that, that word that we've just read there, that word believed, that is the same word that Jesus himself used in John chapter 3 when he said, whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God used this woman in an incredible way as she shared her story. It wasn't only through her testimony that people came to believe in Jesus, but through her testimony, it led others to hear from Jesus for themselves. So in verses 40 and 41, so when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. 
and because of his words, many more became believers. There were already many that became believers because of the woman's testimony, but because this woman acted as a bridge between others and Jesus, many more believed in Jesus. As we have already said, our job ultimately is to connect people with Jesus. Whether at the time of us sharing our testimony already, something happens and the Holy Spirit convicts them and they are ready to surrender to Christ. Praise God. Or God chooses to use us as a bridge for something that will happen later, something that someone else might do. That's also absolutely fine. We should be humble enough to rejoice in, yes, God used me, but man, yes, God used me as a bridge and someone else was able to come along and complete a process that God allowed me to have the privilege of being a part of. So dear friends, we have been saying through the series, and we're closing the series now, we have been saying that the heart of God, the thing that burns in Him, is to save people that don't know Jesus. Jesus said that His mission was to come and to seek and to save the lost lost as in they're in the wrong place in relation to God. They need to be brought into the family of God through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And that's the mission that every follower of Jesus has as well. We've been saying through this series that we can all do that together because all of us have been given this mission by building relationships with people that are not following Jesus. But it cannot end with relationships. That's what we're saying this morning. We must say something. And the something that you and I can say is simply to share our story. This is what Jesus has done in my life. And as we share our story, we weave in the gospel. I've been forgiven. I was a rebel, or I wasn't a rebel, I was doing my own thing and getting everything right, but somehow God showed me that I needed a savior. We weave in the gospel and we point people to Christ, and because salvation belongs to the Lord, we let God do his work in saving. So can we end this series with a resolve with a desire, with a conviction, a passion to go and reach those who are not following Christ that are part of our lives. And this morning, maybe you're the one who's not following Christ. Maybe you can identify with this woman and you're thinking, man, my life is, yeah, that, that's me. I've done some things and it's, it's that easy. I just have to believe, yes. In a sense, it is that easy. You just have to believe. I don't have to fix things myself. I don't have to get my house in order and try harder. No. You just come. Say, Jesus, forgive me. I receive you. So at the end of our service this morning, if that's you, if you would want to come to a personal relationship with Jesus where he is now a Lord of your life and your sins are forgiven, please come and see one of the leaders, Jeremy Sode, myself, Angie, you can see Rebecca, one of the ladies, Heather. And we'd love to help you have a conversation and help you come to a place where you can also know this assurance of who Jesus is, the Savior who forgives, the Savior who gives us a new start. I'd love if we could sing that song, that come to the altar song. Um, could we... Could we stand and respond with that song? 
Father, thank you for all that you have done during this series. Lord, we pray that you would use these three week, weeks to do something special in us, to change our hearts and minds about reaching people far from God, to change our hearts and minds about reaching people who don't know Jesus, to make it a priority, to build friendships with them, to share our lives with them, to pray for them, to ask you to fill us with the Holy Spirit, to be consistent in praying for ourselves, for power, for the right words, for boldness. And Lord, help us to go out and share our testimony, to go out and tell someone what you have done, believing that our story can bring people to a place of believing in Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You're hurting and broken within, overwhelmed by the weight of your sin. Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end? Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious 